Welcome to Municipal Affairs. Now, today we are honored to have Tony Klobiski, president of the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, also known as CAMA, on the show. CAMA is a national not-for-profit organization that serves as a professional network for individuals in senior management positions within Canadian municipalities. Now, this association plays a vital role in supporting municipal leaders as they navigate the complexities of public administration. CAMA sets a high bar for professional standards, expecting its members to uphold accountability, integrity, and a deep commitment to public service. Now, under Tony's leadership, CAMA continues to champion excellence in municipal administration by offering its members opportunities for professional growth. CAMA provides networking events and professional development resources and shares best practices to help foster a culture of service within municipal governance across Canada. Now, in today's episode and conversation, we will hear Tony's insights on the role of CAMA in enhancing leadership within municipalities, the evolving challenges in public administration, and the importance of collaboration and innovation in local governance. Are you looking for a team of experienced professionals to help develop a strategic plan for your municipality? Look no further. At Strategic Steps, their team of experts has years of experience working in municipal administration. They take a comprehensive approach to planning, carefully listening to your community's needs, and working closely with your council to develop a homegrown strategy tailored to your unique community. Contact Strategic Steps today to learn more about how they can help you create a brighter future for your community. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Tony, thank you so much for sitting down with me this morning and talking about this important uh, sector within the municipal world, and that is administration. As president of the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, can you first start off by telling me what CAMA actually is? Uh, CAMA is a national organization that uh, has membership basically uh, from the three territories and all the provinces across Canada. Uh, We have board representation that represents all those areas, and we sit together quarterly uh, to map out basically uh, support and services to our local administrators, no matter how big, how small their municipality is, uh, just to try to strive for that municipal excellence, you know, from the public official uh, uh, point of view. And so we have a number of toolkits that actually offer that kind of support uh, to them. And you know, I always say that it doesn't really matter what size of municipality. It's kind of the same stuff you're dealing with, uh, with uh, the public, the elected officials, the uh, budget constraints, trying to do more with less, like all of it. And it's just, it's magnified in terms of the size of your municipality, obviously. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's a fun, it's a fun gig, uh, but you really have to have some political moxie and some thick skin uh, to basically weather the storm, so to speak. And what would you say is the current state of administrations across the uh, the country right now? Because I'm watching it as an outside observer and I'm seeing a lot of turnover and a lot of challenges from, like yep. you said, the general public to administration. So as president of the organization, how do you describe the state? Well, as a rule of thumb, you know, everyone has to act professionally, uh, knowing that, you know, you receive direction from your elected officials who represent the public you're serving. And so uh, sometimes, you know, I always say, like, if you're providing a recommendation to the council, you have to also accept the fact that they may not see it your way and they're going to go 180 on you and they want to go a different direction. And you have to be okay with that. You know, I just simply ask the councils I've ever worked with, at least hear us out and understand where we're coming from in terms of the recommendation. And if you guys want to go a different direction, well, then at least own that decision that you're making. Uh, Don't be pointing fingers at administration (laughs) when you make a decision that was not, uh, you know, recommended for you to make. Uh, You know, so I I, I think across the country, I think you're starting to see a bit of a a tired workforce, uh, I think, is you know, as much as 
everyone likes to be professional in their in their regular jobs and provide good sound recommendations for decisions and and operate and manage the municipalities to the best of their abilities. I think there's a a, a state of you know. People are tired of getting beat up a little bit on social media or going to an open house and, you know, and getting, you know, characterized as being incompetent or not knowing your your job. And we don't know where that's coming from, but people, it seems like you can say whatever you want on social media and there's no accountability uh, for what you say, rightly or wrongly, on social media. Like there's no uh, courtesy provided anymore. There's no fact checking anymore. It's just like... You know, you say it and well, if Johnny said it, that must be true. Right. And so and here we go. And it's like you're you're spending most of your time uh, deprogramming the people who believe the 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 non information or the the non truths out there instead of actually talking about the thing that you're trying to bring forward to improve a level of service to the municipality. So I think. Generally, though, I think people are just they're tired of of that part of it. Right. And so as much as social media can be a great thing, uh, sometimes it's not so great. And I think that the, the, the um, if I could you know provide recommendation, it's just don't don't worry about the social media, because, I mean, the key keyboard warriors are going to do their thing. And, and in the in between all that, there's probably some truth in some of that. Well, just use that to kind of push out the information that you need to push out. And I really am a big believer in and doing the face to face open houses, uh, and going out to different areas within your community and just have a, a nice <laughs> interface with with the people that you're serving. Um, nine out of ten times, I would say that once people have those discussions face to face, it puts a face to the name, and you're you're basically having a good conversation the way it used to be done. Because I find that when people are behind a screen. You know, they can just type any random thought that comes to their brain without any accountability. And, you know, there's that YouTube video where it shows the two dogs barking at each other and there's a fence in between. And as soon as they open the gate and the dogs look at each other, it's like, oh, I guess we have no problem with each other. And then as soon as they put the gate back, they start barking at each other again. Right. So I think it just don't be afraid to have conversation with people. I mean, they're the people you're serving. And if they have a question or a concern, have a discussion with them. And nine out of 10 times, if you just explain why, the why part, then uh, they, there, there's a better understanding or appreciation as to why we're we're working on something that's ultimately to their benefit. So there, there's two different avenues I want to take on that last statement that you just made. And I want to start with the general public because the general public, and I, I've worked in administrations before, and I know that you have to meet them where they are. And where they are today is not at those town hall meetings. They're not at those public forums. They're on social media. So how do you see the role of administration meeting residents where they are when apathy is at an all-time low in this country when it comes to what's going on at City Hall? And if there's a public hearing, you know who you're going to get. You're going to get the people who are engaged, and those are probably about five to ten people, depending on the size of your population, showing up to those public forums. So how do you meet the general public, those quote unquote keyboard warriors where they are? So you you basically ask those people that come out to your open houses and actually are are walking away with facts in their in their in their hands and facts in their minds after having a, a good conversation to really be the spokespersons uh, that can inform the uninformed uh, on on things and encourage those people to please come out to the open houses because that's where you're going to get the true information and we just got to keep keep working that because you do not want to go into and and the thing is that if we're doing social media then post it on your page so that you're getting your information out on your page do not ever go on another forum or another platform and and post some something even if it's the right it doesn't matter even if it's the right information people are just going to try to pick it apart and you know try to you know make you know make you look like you know the the town idiot so to speak right so don't don't fall into that trap saying, no, uh, if you want information, this is where you need to go. Go to our website. And if you want to have a discussion with a public official uh, or uh, a person working in the organization, we're going to be there. We're, wel- we're welcoming you to come and have those conversations with us in person, but we're not going to entertain um, nonsense on social media. And I think municipalities just to have, have to stand firm on that. Don't get oh my God, everybody's on social media. That's where the electorate is. No, not everybody. Um, 
just say like if you want to have a conversation let's go to the open house and let's have a discussion we're we're open to having those discussions and answering the tough questions at an open house because how that's that's how you that's how you control that silliness and i'm not saying all social media is not bad because if you're trying to get you know a, a basic level of discourse or discussion going with the public sure go ahead but if it's into that you know discussion where it's going to take a couple uh um information boards to kind of get you know across what you're trying to get across um then that that has to be an open house you have to have conversation uh example we just got we're just going through our responsible ownership uh ownership bylaw and uh you know it used to be called the dog bylaw well the problem isn't the dogs the problem is the the owners of the dogs who uh don't like uh having rules placed on them and it's not that we're trying to be you know, extra authoritarian on terms of what you can or cannot do. It's just, if you have a dog, you have to be respectful of your neighbor that who doesn't have a dog that you can't be having your dog, you know, crapping all over the front yard and not picking it up and having him bark unnecessarily all night long. I mean, that's going to cause a disturbance and yeah, you're going to have an unfriendly neighbor because of it. So we retitled it the responsible pet ownership bylaw for that exact reason. The problem is not the dog. The problem is the owner. And this is what you need to do. And if the dog could speak to you, he would probably tell you as the owner, these are the things you should be paying attention to, sir. <laughs> you know, so we, we we posted that stuff on social media. And yeah, right away, people were like ch chirping right away about all they thought we were trying to take away their, you know, rights and freedoms and all this kind of nonsense. And I go, guys, that's not what this is about. It's about this. And I said, if you come out to the open house, we'll have all the information out there. We'll try to let you guys know, you know, what the bylaw is actually about and what it's not about. And then we're now at the process where we can bring a bylaw now to second and third reading at our next meeting because we've had like four open houses. We've had a lot of dialogue with the community. And now we've got the community on site saying, wow, this is amazing. This is really going to work. And thank you. You know, when you hear the public saying thank you, <laughs> on bringing forward a bylaw all right <laughs> we're we're on the right track here and i think it's just the point is don't be afraid to have hard conversations with the public i mean if you're trying to do something that's going to maybe change their life in some way shape or form you got to expect that there's going to be some pushback and i said if you can explain the why part I would say nine out of 10 times, you're going to be a happy customer leaving the door at the end of it, because at least they'll understand where you're coming from. They may not totally agree with it, but at least they can understand the why part. And I think that's the part that sometimes municipalities forget to do is the why part. And it comes down as like, we're going to shove it down their throat no matter what. Well, if you don't explain the why part, you're just setting yourself up for a bunch of trouble, right? I would say about 10, 15 years ago, the scrutiny of the municipal government was solely laid at the uh, the the feet of council. They are the ones who are making the decisions. I would say probably COVID-19 and post-COVID-19, the scrutiny has kind of changed to the administration and people are more concerned about what administration is doing because they're not elected. How does council play a role in addressing concerns when the blame that public may have is aimed at the administration and not at council who's making the decisions that administration is trying to implement. Yeah. I, yeah. And it's, it's an easy one. It's they, the elected officials need to stand up and support their staff at all costs. And they need to tell the public, look, we employ these guys to actually do a job for us. We want them to run the municipality. We don't want to be in their kitchen every day to know what, executive decision they're making they know what the policies are they need to follow the policy direction they have a budget that's been approved by us and they know what they need to get accomplished and they have to show results with a quarterly report that shows how the money is being spent uh and that we have an auditing pr uh, process that talks about how the the finances have been accounted for so um really the decision making let lies with council and if you have a problem with the decision that council has made either through policy or through a program then you need to bring that and elevate your concern to the council level so we can look at it and if it's something that needs to be changed we'll direct the administration accordingly to relook at this bring it back to council so they can make a decision and on we go and i think the councils that are successful across the country that take that approach saying, you know, the decision rests with us, please bring it to my attention so that we can at least have that conversation with administration. And if council feels the same way as you do on this matter, 
we will make the appropriate direction and, and the administration will follow that. And then we'll per report on activity because of that change. I think that's the message that needs to be said loud and clear. It's not the public administrator, myself as a CAO, going willy nilly and making decisions on my own. Uh, no, um, to a certain extent, we're, we're given some freedom to, to make some decisions on, on certain matters, but largely we follow that direction through our strat plan, through our policy documents, and certainly within our budgets. So for me to stray from those pretty rigid pieces, including the admissible legislation, it's pretty hard to do. And the ones that do, well, they find themselves in a lot of heat and trouble, and they have a very short career in municipal government. Let's put it that way. How important is transparency in today's age? Because we talk about the scrutiny, we talk about the openness, and we talk about the information that is out there. You can only be as transparent as you can be, because you do have those legislations that you have in place that might bind administration a little bit, but from the role as of the administrator, how important is it to be transparent when presenting something to council and to the general public about why you as administration has come up with an idea to make your community a little bit better in your eyes? I think transparency is incredibly important. And I think it goes both ways, both uh, from a CAO to a council and a council to a CAO. Nobody likes surprises. And I think you just have to be straight up, good news or bad news. And even if it's bad news and you have to share, you know, news with counsel, don't cover it up. Like, just be truthful and honest and say, look, things didn't go as planned. We've got an overage on this particular project. Here are the reasons why. It's easily explainable. And then this is the messaging that's going out to the public. It's being transparent. You know, and no, nobody is perfect and, and nothing ever goes as planned, no matter who you are in this planet, nothing ever goes as planned. And you always have a contingency or you have a, you know, go, go on holidays and tell me that everything goes as planned when you go on a holiday adventure. They never do. They can, so you have to be able to have the ability to pivot quickly and still come out ahead at the end of the day that you have some success to show for it. But I think it's being transparent throughout the process. I, I do check-ins with council all the time. I do a confidential weekly every Friday just to let everybody know what's going through my desk this week, just so everybody knows what's going on in my world. Some of it's probably not earth-shattering information, and some of it's good to know uh, because there's things that are coming forward that they, they will need to pay attention to uh, and that they can't go, gee, how come we didn't know about this three months ago? Well, you actually did uh, because I let you know three months ago and that this was coming. So I have that great relationship with my council where uh, they're they're informed weekly uh, as to what's going through my desk and some of the things they need to be paying attention to either provincially or federally that may have an impact on the local municipality. So I think that part of it has to be a cornerstone of your every day you go to work. You have to be that mindset as to how, how to be you know transparent with with your employers. Now, I want to turn to the role of the chief administrative officer or town manager or however, whatever yeah. province you're listening to this, the top job, the only job that council actually hires and fires. And, and I want to start at the overarching question, which is there are many provinces and territories across this province right now who are in an election period or are about to head into an election period. Does the role of the administrator change dramatically during an election period or even during an election? Because you're still trying to steer the ship, but you're also trying to watch what potential mayor candidates are talking about, what the council candidates are talking about, to ensure that when they come back into council or whoever's elected, you're going to be able to adapt to what their wants and needs are going to be, aren't you? Yeah. And and I think the key is that the strat plan is a strat plan. You still have to continue on that work. Right up but did, but can I can I can I quote, can I interject there for a second? Yeah. Do do the more majority of candidates know what a strat plan is? To be honest, uh, well, not <laughs> not everyone. And I, I guess the challenge is that when you have the elections over and all the dust is settled, and you've got your you know five six day period after they can actually formally declare that these are the new elected uh, folks. Even if it's the same council that gets reelected, it's a still it's a new council, and so you have to go through the orientation. Um, on the MGA, it could be review for some. It may be, uh, wow, I didn't remember. I don't remember that section of the MGA. Thank you for going through that. Then you go through the strat plans. Then you go through the departmental briefings, and you talk about the work plans that have been working on for the past year. You talk about the capital plans. You go through a formal orientation. The first 
we probably month, couple months for any new member of council, uh, especially if they're brand new to the whole thing is probably, I would think pretty overwhelming because it's a lot of information to go through. Um, but it, it, part of it is just team building is, is having that elected council learn how to work together um, because everyone has their probably one piece that they've, they, they ran on as part of their campaign platform, but, you have to get the other six members of your council to agree with you on that so that it becomes part of the priority setting exercise in, in terms of the new strat plan that we'll be working on. So your job is incredibly important to kind of bridge that gap to say, this is what the previous council was working on. Even if it's new members that, or sorry, if it's the current members that got reelected, it's still a new council. So the question is, do you guys want to continue on this work on the strat plan or do you want to, maybe tweak some things here so that we can continue working on this for the next say four years. And what are the priorities we need to work on? If it's a brand new council or if you get three or four new members, again, new dynamic, you have to get those three up to speed and it cannot be the old council versus the new council. It's a new council and they have to whitewash really what they've been through for the past four years and come up with a new direction as to what they want to do. And it's largely what they heard through the election campaign from when they went door knocking as to what the priorities are. And some of that stuff matches up perfectly with what they were already working on. Some of it might be brand new stuff. So then it's, you know, that priority setting exercise and, you know, how important was this? And can you live with it not being maybe worked on this year, but maybe we work on it in the second year of your term. And, and that's the, the, you know, how they, they barter around the council table to figure out, you know, how, how they can, you know, come to a consensus on what really is the, the priorities for this first year coming into a new term. So you can play a role in that and trying to help guide them, but it's not your plan. It's it's their plan. And, and you have to help them rest on what are the priorities for the upcoming term. And, and that's the fun part of, of the job is that you can help guide that. It's it cannot be seen as you directing the new counselors what you think is important. It has to be their plan and it has to be their words and it has to be what they heard during the election campaign to make it theirs. Because ultimately, when they approve the budget, it's their budget. It's not your budget. And the priorities will be shown in the budget they approve both for operating and capital. And that's coming out of their strat planning work. So the first month and a half is probably the most important for the new council coming off an election because the orientation is super important, making sure they understand their roles and responsibilities and understanding, you know, that line, your governance, we're operations. And I have the role of playing, you know, I can put a foot on both sides to try to help guide, but, you know, we, we take direction from council once you provide it and we'll, we'll go, we'll make, we'll make it work. You talk about the issues that are being brought up at the door and when they come back to council and they're addressing what they hear. Now, I have talked to many municipal leaders on my show, and the one question I often talk to them about is the provincial jurisdiction, the federal jurisdiction, and what they're supposed to do in the municipal jurisdiction. As an administrator, how important is it to keep the municipal council in the municipal jurisdiction and not let them get into the weeds of that provincial jurisdiction because often when you get into those weeds the province federal government territorial governments may say well if you want to take it we'll download it upon you and that's more responsibility for the municipality yeah well i have a slide on one of my slide decks where it talks about staying in your lane and uh, as a municipal government, you need to learn how to stay in your lane because the province probably would love to download everything onto the local municipality. They've been doing it for years. Uh, sometimes people complain about it because it usually comes without a lot of funding to take care of their issues. Um, and in some municipalities, they cherish the fact that they can take on some of those issues. But, you know, I always say there's only one taxpayer. And ultimately, it comes down to what we can afford as a local municipality. And you go through that whole level of service uh, in debate at a council level. And it comes down to if you want this kind of level of service, this is what's going to cost you and the taxpayer. What are you prepared to, to you know, pass on to the to the ratepayer to pay for? And then that's when it, the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and go, oh, we can't afford a double digit tax rate increase. OK, what are we cutting? You know, and then if we start piecemealing it or going you know zero based budgeting and trying to hammer at what what are the priorities here that's where they soon realize okay 
that's stay in our lane here. That's only do the stuff that municipalities should be working on. And if if we are taking some downloaded responsibilities from the province, then we have to have those conversations with our local MLAs and the appropriate ministers uh, to have a conversation about funding mechanisms to kind of help support that. I mean, ultimately, we we're in a we're in a partnership. Uh, we have to t- approach this as a partnership with the province. I mean, we're creatures of the provincial legislation through the MGA. So we have to see them as a partner in, in trying to provide service to our, our directorate or electorate, I should say. Um, it's interesting at the federal level uh, how, how that plays also a role uh, because, I mean, municipalities aren't recognized really by the constitution of, of, of Canada. So they see the provinces and then we're basically creatures of the province. So it's interesting dynamic when, you know, some municipalities are able to get pretty sizable funding agreements uh, from the federal government for other things besides the gas tax revenue. And they're, they're able to, you know, have some great initiatives happening in their local municipality as a result of it. Right. And of course there's been some, you know, I'd say provincial federal discussion on, on terms of how that is the most appropriate, right? So I, I'm I'm happy to hear that I think some of that stuff has been kind of been able to get itself worked out because there is a role to play, I think, from all three levels of government working on things that are important. Uh, I think drinking water, clean drinking water for everyone is pretty important. Housing for everyone is important. I mean, the biggest concern we're seeing at local municipalities is of, of the state of homelessness. And, it, and it's it's a big concern. And I don't think it's appropriate that, you know, municipalities are allowing tent cities with propane tanks uh, to be built for the people that are homeless. I mean, they could say that, well, people choose to live that way, but is that okay? Uh, you know, I think municipalities and societies are often judged on how they look after the most vulnerable citizens in their community. And if that's the best we can do, then I think we need to do better. And I don't have an answer, but I think we just need to, you know, engage with a whole, all three levels of government to try to find a solution to some of these bigger issues that are facing our whole country. (laughs) We we talk about the jurisdictional role. How important is is it? So, tangent time i apologize right now yeah. but i recently went through a process where i was in the in the running the contention to be a cao for a small community and during that process one of the concerns that i heard from council is they wanted to be more involved in what administration was doing they wanted to be more hands on they wanted to be more uh impactful on what administration is doing now the role of council is to govern And the role of administration is to administer the governance policies that they have put forward. As an administrator, as administrators across this province are seeing that those blurring of that, hopefully not blurring, but they're being asked to be more uh, lenient with how council is working with the administration. How important is it to stand up and say, your role is governance, our role is to administer what you want done? Yeah, I say if you wanted the job, you should have applied for it um, <laughs> and resigned your position. And secondly, the way you deal with it as a CAO is that you go through a comprehensive policy review process. If it takes you three months, eight months, whatever, you, every community, the whole meeting you have, you're going through a departmental policy debrief and get council focused on governance by going through policy review. And don't stop until every policy is actually uh, reviewed. Even if the amendment is changing a couple of words or the dates on when it's going to be reviewed the next time, it forces council to start thinking in the governance frame of mind. Uh, and then it's a good orientation, not only for council, but also a good review for your staff. And so we went through that here at Westlock County. It took us about, I would say, eight months, and we went through 138 policies. We went through, I think, 10 different bylaws, and there were amendments made throughout. Some of them were actually repealed. Uh, some were deleted entirely. And then we out of that process came probably 10 more brand new policies, right? So our council is very now gar- uh, grounded in, in the whole policy uh, part of it. And they understand that if they're going to give direction to an administration, you do it through policy. And that's how you do it. Or, you know, obviously through council resolution, but it's usually grounded in policy work. And so that would be my advice is that make sure that it's very clear right from the beginning. There's there's that line in the sand. You are you cannot be in the kitchen. You have one employee. That's their job. And if you don't like what's going on in the kitchen, then look at your policy. 
and go, what do we need to change in our policy to have that impact? That's how council provides their impact. And they don't need to be in the kitchen. They can just simply give direction through policy. I want to turn to the role of administration as a whole and the challenges that administration is dealing with right now. Staffing shortages and employee retention are challenges in many, many municipalities today. How can municipalities attract and retain skilled professionals in a, an increasingly competitive environment? Because we are seeing, and I hate to use the word poach, but poaching of good employees to larger municipalities. And that means smaller urban communities are being left behind in some sense because they don't have the proper staff to function. Yeah, well, it, the demographic shift is happening across the whole country. I've seen that. Um, it's, it's. I think it's particularly worse off in certain areas of our country, more so than some some other provinces. And you're right. Uh, if you don't have uh, candidates either through succession planning within your organization, uh, you're you're basically trying to, uh, you know, you don't go through a recruitment firm right away. You you advertise through normal channels. And hopefully get some people who are interested in moving in your particular area. Usually it's family or cl getting close to family or to a major center is usually the the attraction piece. Uh, I don't even think it's salary dollars anymore. It's about where, where they're moving closer to. And as you get a little bit older, you realize how more, much more important family is. So you want to be closer to family. Um, you know, we've, we've been able to, uh, attract position or people to our organization here and we've also lost a couple of people to uh, other opportunities and it's i mean all you do is it's part of the evolution of municipal government you you gain some you lose some and when you lose them it's because they are going on to better uh better opportunities uh, that you can provide in your own organization and so that's i guess the good news is that you know you want to make it so that the organization is a happy place to work in uh, and that people feel comfortable, they feel respected, you're not micromanaging them, you're allowing them some freedom to, you know, not fail miserably, but it's okay to fail, but learn from it so that you don't uh, make that same mistake again, or else you're you're in my office and we're talking about your performance. Um, but you allow people the freedom to to learn and, and, and that really your job is to build uh, more leaders in your organization so that you can build that culture of excellence, right? And that's kind of the approach you have to take. Um, I think we're going to run out of people to poach from, though, and if we don't start building our homegrown talent. And so I've spoken about this before. Uh, you know, I go to a conference and I ask the delegates by show of hands, how many of you people thought you'd be in municipal government when you graduated high school or let alone college? Nobody raises their hand <laughs> because nobody nobody thought they'd ever be in municipal government. And and so I think there's a huge opportunity for every municipal organization uh, to try to go to your local high school uh, career fairs and then try to put on a, 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 a municipality uh, trade share that shows trade show that actually shows every level of your organization, not just the city managers, the CEOs, but your development officer, your greater operators, your public works employees, your water treatment operators, so that kids who don't really know what they want to do uh, as a career are at least exposed to these potential opportunities. You could start as low as junior high because they all have options about, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, nobody really knows. I remember I was in junior high. I had no idea. I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I went into my first year of college and I go, no, I don't want to be a teacher anymore. And then I evolved. I, I wanted to be different. a, I wanted to be a priest. So that tells you where I am in my, <laughs> my career trajectory. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, everybody thinks they know what they want to do. Right. And then, and then you, you live some life and then you realize, no, I actually want to do this instead. And so I thought if we could, you know, not that you're trying to manipulate young people in terms of where they want to go, but at least provide a couple of seats. Because when I, and when I was young, I mean, the only job you could look forward to in the municipality was being a weed walk whacker or working in the parks through cutting grass. You know, if I would have been given the opportunity to have a summer practicum working in the wastewater treatment plant or the water treatment plant and how do they treat water to make it, you know, drinkable uh, through your taps, I mean, that would have interest me, right? And maybe that's a career path I would have taken. Uh, but because you're not exposed to that, you, you just don't know. And and so I just thought, you know, in our own local communities, 
you could have your next CAO or your next general manager of planning and development in your own community. And if you actually work with them and you can provide maybe some scholarship programs to help them get there, uh, get their certificate, and you can maybe do a practicum placement in your own community for these kids that are from your own community going through post-secondary, hey, you may have a solution in your own community. You're just not looking at it right now because it's easy to put an ad out in the paper going, hey, we need this person. And if you don't get anybody, then you hire a recruiter and they start poaching people off different organizations. Well, did you ever think that maybe that person is residing in your own community and you just have to invest the time to try to, you know, get that information out to them. And and maybe, just maybe, they might go to post-secondary and actually uh, come back and work for you at some place in the future. So I, I just think that that's something that we need to start looking at uh, because I honestly think there are a lot of kids in, in going through junior high and high school that are, I wouldn't say they're lost, but they don't really know what they want to do. And I don't think that's ever changed in, over time. Nobody, you know, you maybe get 1% of the graduating class that goes, I know for sure what I want to do. Good, go for it. You know, they play for all their scholarships. They get in there and they're top of the class. I would say a large majority of the graduating class in grade 12, they don't really know. Yeah. You know, and it takes them a year and a half of traveling and getting into debt. Then they realize, geez, I need to get a job and I need to go to post-secondary for something, right? But but does the role of the CAO, is, is, isn't it as, as attractive as it was 20 years ago? I see numerous, and I say numerous respectfully, numerous job postings about CAO positions in these smaller rural urban towns, like a population in Saskatchewan, they are having a dickens of a time trying to attract CAOs to rural communities. In Manitoba, northern communities are having troubles as well. Is the CAO position one that people want anymore? Good question. Uh, I know, know that my background... Uh, is that I purposely worked in smaller municipalities uh, over the early part of my career because I felt it'd be a great opportunity to be exposed to every part of the organization working in the, in the smaller municipality. I mean, you're talking, you know, staff size of maybe 10 or less, and and you're probably going to be driving a snowplow. You're probably going to drive into a, or drop into a, a pit, uh, a, a culvert to basically create or fix a CC valve. Like, so I was exposed to a lot of cool things, you know, working in smaller municipalities, and I relished at it because when you, you move into a CA role for a larger municipality, you've had exposure to all these different areas. You know how important health and safety is to the entire organization because you've been exposed to every element of these things. So my message, again, to other people looking at, at looking at a CAO position is that make sure or don't be afraid to um, – to work in smaller municipalities to get that needed experience because when you get to the larger one, believe me, trust me, you, you, that experience is going to come in handy big time, especially when you're presenting budgets or or, or talking about policy. The, those positions that, hey, I'm going right from college to be the post of the city manager of Regina, Saskatchewan, those don't exist. <laughs> I can tell you honestly, they they look for people that have experience, numbers of years of experience, good schooling. And they look for a wide variety of uh, experience, small, medium, rural, urban, because I think the more experience you have in all those different areas, it just makes you a more well-rounded uh, city manager, or town manager, or county manager uh, to help lead the organization. And I, 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 if there was any message to the people, you know, looking at, you know, career options and you're a director level or general manager, don't be afraid to go you know, work in another municipality uh, and, and get that experience at that level because it's going to come in handy uh, when those bigger positions are offered. And it sounds like from the demographic shift across the country, um, there's going to be tons of opportunities um, as people retire away from the from the operations of work, running a, 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 a an organization at the municipal level. One last question on this topic before we begin to wrap up, and I have a few yep. questions about the organization as a whole. Earlier this year, I hosted a forum in Manitoba with Duane Nichols, the then president of the MMA, the Municipal Administrators Association there in the province. And it was about the political nexus that the role of administrators have to deal with now, because the role is now more political than it probably ever has been. How does how do you see the role being more political than more hands on with an actual administration? Because 
councils are looking for those connections. How will you be able to put me in front of the minister? Or how will you be able to connect with your neighboring communities? Because you are their first point of contact. What is the political nexus that administrators have to go through in today's sort of ever collaborative, but also not collaborative approach that they have? Well, I mean, part of your your job in your role as a CAO is relationship building. And you got to have those relationships with senior officials in higher orders of government, um, not the political side, but the, the administrative side, so like the policy folks, the administrators of all the different programs from the different departments. You got to get out there and get to know those folks because it helps basically pave that pathway for the elected officials to have that um relationship with you know the elected officials at the provincial level right so it's relationship building on both sides of it you just don't phone up the mla and say hey you know we need two million dollars for our water <laughs> i mean you have to build up a, a bit of a relationship here and be, have the ability to you know clearly identify what the need is and and how you guys can work in partnership to kind of you know deal with that stuff right but you know what am i seeing across the country i mean there's some cases of pretty pretty extreme uh, civic incivility and you know and that goes with the trying to you know unnerve the public trust and local government so that's something to be mindful of and it goes back to your earlier question about being transparent and and basically you know these are the if you can answer the why part and why these decisions are being made and that everything is out in the public realizing that yes sometimes we go in camera to discuss matters that are you know provided through legal advice but eventually that information will be released to the public. And I think most public recognize and realize that you have to have sometimes those private conversations. Um, but if they understand that eventually those decisions will be made public through either budget documents or, or public policy, I think people need to realize that the elected officials have a role to play in, in making those decisions. So I, I just think, you know, you have, you have to respect the process. Uh, we live in a democracy. So you know, it can't be one person ruling council. It has to be, you know, the whole of council having their positions known uh, in terms of how they feel about a topic. And, and it represents the public that uh, we elected them into office. And so, you know, it's an important role that they have. And they have sometimes to make the best decision for their overall community. It might not be the most popular decision, but if they can truly go to sleep at night knowing that they debated and they listened and they understood all the different uh, opinions on the topic matter and at the end of the day they came up with a, maybe a compromised uh, decision making on on the topic at hand then they at least did their job in trying to hear everyone's concerns and sometimes people may feel like there's winners and losers in, in that but if the council is truly trying to find a compromise and trying the best for everyone i think people respect councils that that take that approach to dealing with whatever issue they're dealing with as opposed to taking the winner loser approach, like try to always find a consensus if you can or a compromise. Uh, and if it's you can't, well, then people at least appreciate that you took the effort to do that, um, and that before you came to your decision, right? So, I think the role we play in helping that or help guide that kind of discussion, I think, is an important one. And again, it's just having that political moxie of knowing when to say what you need to say. And then backing off and just letting council do their thing and come to a decision. We've talked about a lot of the challenges and the accomplishments that administration has been dealing with. How does CAMA play a role in fostering education, uh, networking, collaboration within its own member communities? Because I know you recently just got back from Yellowknife where you were meeting with as the board. So yeah. As a board, as an organization, how do you work with large municipalities, small municipalities to ensure that they're all successful from an administrative standpoint? Well, we we spent a lot of time on leadership development uh, master classes that are you know online webinars, trying to find the topics of t t topics that are very very timely and try and at least have a discussion point on, on that particular topic. If we feel it's something that needs a little bit more uh, research into, or at least uh, some information to help support the member, then we'll go into the toolkit uh, idea. And so we've probably have over, I would say a dozen offerings of different toolkits that are on our website right now that people can, you know, check into um, 
you know, and it, it's taking a national lens to to the issue, realizing that it may not be exactly how you deal with it in your particular area within the country. But we did truly try to look at a national lens where we were incorporating different viewpoints across the country to come up with something that would help uh, people um, with the issue they're dealing with. Um, I think the benefit of our, our annual conference is a, a great way of networking uh, with colleagues across the country. And, you know, I've said it before, uh, is that, you know, I might have an issue here in my, in my own municipality that I'm struggling with. And I find out that somebody in Montreal is dealing with the same issue and they've came up with a kind of a creative solution uh, on how to unpack it and, and deal with that particular issue, right? That you've never even thought about. That's the beauty of networking and having a national organization is that there, there's always these emails, exchanges going back and forth asking people, hey, how did you deal with this issue? And it's that knowledge sharing piece that I think is a real benefit uh, to a growing organization. And it, it really provides that level of service to the membership. Because at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the best we can. We all want to strive for organizational excellence and serve the, bu the public to the best of our abilities and really serve our elected councils to the best of our abilities. Everybody goes to work with that same mindset. And so sometimes you just, you haven't had that exposure to that situation you're dealing with. And you're struggling trying to find out uh, how do I deal with this, right? And so the beauty of networking is just allowing you to share your concern or share your your what you're dealing with and then having the ability for someone to say, hey, I can help with that. We dealt with the exact same thing four years ago. And this is some things that we we considered. And, they, and then it's a way of saying, hey, I never thought about that. I can explore that further. And if they have a draft policy, they can share that. And, and then you're off to the races. And then you you know dialogue with your council and realize that yeah that's exactly what we're waiting for or looking for and then you, you can you know on onwards you go right and really that's the beauty I think of of CAMA I mean I've been with the CAMA board now as an Alberta representative for almost eight years now and by the time I'm done being president and then past president it'll be a decade worth of support and work on on a lot of you know a lot of toolkits a lot of support to our membership so you know I'm pretty proud that I've you know, been involved with that for a whole decade in supporting the profession across the country. I think we've done a lot of great work in support of our members and ultimately supporting uh, local municipalities, no matter, you know, how big or how small. Final question for you here, Tony, and it's an important one because we always like to look to the future and what the future has in store. What are your expectations for the future of municipal administrations in Canada? I think not to lose hope. I, I think that uh, I think we have to realize that we still serve the public, uh, no matter what that looks like going forward. I think uh, policy discussion at the council level is extremely important, uh, and it's going to be trying to you know whoever coined the phrase "doing more with less." Uh, I hate them because <laughs> it's impossible, <laughs> but uh, it's it's trying to be um, I guess open minded of possibilities and solutions, innovative solutions to deal with things that you th never thought were possible before. And I think partnerships is going to be key, working collaboratively with regional governments of some sort on unpacking some of these issues. I think there's limited tax dollars available. So, you know, does it make sense that every municipality that within three kilometers of each other each has a brand new fire truck? Probably not. Uh, so is there a way of maybe looking at that differently uh, and setting up something differently? So it's not about winners and losers, it's about how do you work together collaboratively to serve the public? And I think as long as we remember those words that you're in it to serve the public and you're trying to find the best way of, of serving the public with the least amount of impact on their personal dollars that they have available to them, I think that's the key here. Um, it's But yeah, relationship building is key. Uh, working in partnerships is key, knowing that the tax dollars are quite limited. So you're going to have to be pretty innovative to try to find solutions to the growing needs that we all have across the country. Tony, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down with me today and talking about this important issue. I feel like we just scratched the surface, but uh, we'll probably continue this conversation on a later date. So thank you so much. Right on. Thanks, Chris.
Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Municipal Affairs. We hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with Tony. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. The link to Kama's website is in the show notes below. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you more important conversations like you heard today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on Municipal Affairs. Till then.